it, yeah, we have a reputation of like being the the party, <laughs> the first year who parties the most because you just have so much spare time on your hands. Hi everyone, this is the Oxford and Cambridge Project. I'm Opportune Simon. Today we have Baran Gio with us. Baran is currently a research associate at an urban intelligence advisory firm. She graduated from Girton College in 2018 with a first class degree in land economy. And Baran has roots in both France and Cameroon and grew up in Paris where she did the French baccalaureate with an international option. During her time at university, Brian was captain of her college lacrosse team, uh, was co-president of the Girton French Society and events officer for the Cambridge University French Society. Hi, Brian. That's so nice to have you on. Hi, everyone. Thank you for having me up. I'm glad to have you on the podcast, Brian. I've known you for quite a while <laughs> now. We actually met uh, at work uh, after university, but we also did the same degree. So... <laughs> <laughs> Um, so yeah, Brian, I think it'd be great to start with maybe your background and talk about your life in Paris in high school and how you got to apply to Cambridge. Yeah, of course. So as you said, I grew up in Paris. Um, I have a really French background. No one in my family uh, thought of uh, studying abroad. And I, but I was in an international school and that really, I think, got me to like think about like the different options. Um, I think it was only, I always thought I would be studying in France for higher education, but I ended up, um, I think in when I was 16, um, I call it my high school, like uh, advisor said that if I wanted, I could apply to like Cambridge or Oxford. So that got into my head and I just started looking at like the different courses and I wanted, uh, I was kind of in between like economics, geography and <laughs> while I was scrolling the Cambridge page, I just found like land economy and that sounded like a great course combining a lot of like different interests. Well, looking at like the content, I was really, because like economics, there was a lot of um, uh, theoretical economics that I wasn't sure I well I knew I wouldn't enjoy it and I was like I'm not sure I want like to spend like my first year just like learning about like boring theories that do not even apply now um, and same in uh, for geography uh, there was a lot of like physical geography and even though it's interesting I was like I'm not sure I want to like devote so much of my time on this and I think uh, land economy is like one of them because it's so new I and mean, it has a lot of input like from professional uh like people in the business world like it's quite um practical actually and a lot of like the knowledge you learn um has um a lot of implications and it's good knowledge for like when you're going into the business world after and also i think there's a there are so many different like papers you can take and I thought that was really the, what really attracted me, what appealed me to the course is just that you kind of like pick and choose what you want from like a lot of like economics or like law, like from, you can do private law, public law, constitutional law, or more like environmental uh, policies. And I thought that was great because even though, well, I never really thought like I was interested in law, but it was great to have the option to like study it and it was like one of like my favorite papers like in the in the nice and what were your other university choices because obviously you said that originally not many people were attracted to like going abroad so did you mostly apply in france mm, yeah i applied uh <laughs> through uh admission plus back and it was, um, so yeah, I apply, in France, the system is a bit different. So I applied for like preparatory classes to then integrate like the whole But I knew that it wasn't like really what I wanted to do. And it's kind of like a classic uh, path uh, to higher education in France if you don't want to go straight to uni, um, to the public uni. 
Um, and then in the, um, I mean, a lot of my friends were like applying to the US or to Canada and to and to the UK, but I just decided that I just did France and, and the UK. How did you go about applying? Did you have help from your school? Um, I had a bit of help from my school, I guess, just the um, counselor was reading our personal statement and telling us when to apply and but I think it was mostly like support from my family. I had one cousin <laughs> who studied in the in the US and he was really good at like making me like well as reading my personal statement and advising me on like what not what to say but how to say it. Because I guess the French system is quite different to the British system and in terms and also I guess like applying to Cambridge, they're kind of like looking for like different skills or different mindsets and you want to be like in France, like everything is quite structured and like methodological, uh, whatever you write, like a cover letter, motivation letter. Whereas like, I guess for like Cambridge, it was more about showing how passionate you're about um, a topic, like how much you're trying to learn about it and think about the box and apply it to your like personal life. And, um, and I think that really made the difference. So, so yeah, I was <laughs> lucky I had my cousin for that. And um, apart from that, yeah, I guess also they, they, they usually tell you, but I wasn't sure about like which grades I was supposed to have, like to apply to same like here when you grow up in, in, in the UK, you know about A levels, you know, okay, you need two A stars, one A, uh, whereas it's completely different, the grading system in France. So, so yeah, I actually contacted like uh, Cambridge admissions a um, few times to like know <laughs> Uh, okay, what are your requirements? What do you think is like, um, uh, like I was a bit stressed about the differences in level, like math in French compared to like math in, uh, in, in, in the UK in A-level, but actually it was just super easy. It wasn't like too hard to adjust when I actually got there. So I didn't have to do too much extra work <laughs> on the, during the holidays. That's good. You were really proactive, which I probably should have been a bit more of. Um, <laughs> But yeah, they, they are, I mean, even if in, you know, the courses, there are not that many differences between the French and English system, I'd say like just the fact that you're switching to a, a education system that's wholly in English, mm. uh, it can be a bit of a shock and you obviously have to allow that time for, for the switch. Um, and so, so what were the grades that they asked you to get then when you got your offer? <clears throat> so my condition was... 216 in uh, three subjects, so mathematics, economics, and history. And then I was supposed to have a 16 in English as well. well I think that was quite similar to me. I think I was supposed to have um, 16 for all three subjects. Or did hmm. you say you had two 16s only? I ended up having more than, I uh, having the two yeah. 16, but they only said two out of the three. So oh. that was... <laughs> Great. Can you talk to us about the application process and I guess the interview process really? Do you remember how that went? <laughs> I was trying to think and I was like, oh, I'm, I, I, I think it's like a time that you kind of try to erase from your memory. Yeah. The, so first you go with like the personal statement, the application. I guess with land economy, there's one thing where it's a bit trickier because obviously Cambridge is the only uh, university to, pro to defend that course. So it was um, so for all the other unis in the UK where I applied, I was applying for economics. So my personal statement was more about economics. But then when you go through the form uh, on the Cambridge website, they um, uh, ask if you have anything else to say to add to your personal statement. So that's where I actually talked about why uh, I was really interested in doing specifically land economy. And um, so, yeah, that's one thing to <laughs> take into account if you're applying for that. And then, then I think I got, so you apply by the 15th of October. And then I think I got my interview in December. And that was a bit stressful because you just don't know what to expect. <laughs> so what I did was uh, when they tell you who is going to be your interviewer, like you look who they are online and you see. So for example, I had um, Philippe Arrestes, so I knew it was going to be like about math. And then I had... Um, Nigel Ellington, I think, um, where I knew it was going to be about like macroeconomics mostly. 
And, uh, and so, yes, I kind of like made sure that everything I knew in my personal statement, I told, I mentioned in my personal statement, I would, I knew what I was like talking about. Um, but yeah, I think I was in a way quite lucky because there was this book in my library, for example, it was like brain teasers to go into Cambridge and uh, well, that they might ask you, but I never had like really, really hard questions, uh, like out of the blue. Uh, I know some of my friends in land economy did, uh, but yeah, it really depends on your interviewers. So I think you just, the main thing is like, be happy to discuss about anything. Like don't be distraught by like a, a really weird question, ask questions back if you're not sure about anything or because in, in a way it's like trying to see if you'll be able to adjust to the supervision system. So in a way it's like, they want to see that you can engage with the questions and like not like close up, I guess. And they want to see how your thought process when you get asked like this type of question. So, so yeah, I think it was, I remember like, a, yeah, I went there alone. It was on two days and um, yeah. And so I went there alone, I stayed overnight and I was like super, super stressed. But at the same time, like the questions but yeah, no, the only tricky part is, as we said, like adjusting, like having to say math concepts in like English was a bit like tricky. Like I, I, I yeah, I wasn't re ready for like the language barrier on that. Yeah. And so you said, given that you had done the international option in the baccalaureate, did you, al you already had some like classes in English? Is that right? Yeah. So I had, um, well, I only had history, to be honest, in English and that's it. And then English was a bit like a uh, more in-depth, English literature was a bit more in-depth than you would have in the normal French baccalaureate. But yeah, history was a mix. We had classes both in French and English, but the rest of it, it was more, um, it was completely French. So that's another thing, like, for example, for economics, I just knew that I had to like get, um, catch up and like read more things in like in English just to be like just to have my words ready, like when I had to answer the questions. Yeah. And so would you recommend to anyone who's in the French system, who's wanting to apply there, would you recommend them doing the international option or do you think that's something that you don't really necessarily have to do? Um, I don't think you necessarily have to do it. It's just that, well, to be fair, yeah. Another thing is like, for example, because my school was international, I did IGCSEs, but just like the English language ones, English language and literature. But that was enough for me not to have to take any English exams, like to certify my level of English. Okay. Whereas I knew that people who went through the normal route had to take like either the TEFL or the IELTS uh, in addition um, to their like French baccalaureate to make sure that they had the uh, correct well the adequate uh, English level uh, so yeah that's one thing but other than that I feel like yeah one of my best friends she did physics and like she was in the French system for like really long time and she never like really struggled with that and like she didn't need to yeah she didn't need to do like the internal international option and actually I met a lot of like French people in the, through the Cambridge University French Society and a lot and I was surprised like a lot of them were just from normal like uh, state schools and um, yeah that was good to see like I guess it's just a you have to go a bit like one mile extra because you have much more work to provide uh, yourself and like usually the schools are not like they don't know how to do it so you're the one who has to do the research you're the one who has to know how to apply, what your school has to provide to the uni and everything. So, but yeah, it's still doable. <laughs> Great. Um, so coming back to your application and interview process, did you um, apply at Groton straight away? Um, no, uh, <laughs> I applied at Darwin. It's, yeah, I guess also coming from a different system, it's, uh, you don't really understand the colleges. And um, so I remember going in maybe September or October with my dad visiting Cambridge and we're just like walking uh, along, like visiting a few different like colleges. And and so, yeah, I kind of took downing because it was still quite large. Like, I think it takes like, yeah, 100, 
50 like students around that 130 maybe and uh, so I knew I would like meet a lot of people like in first year and that's really what I wanted I, I was less and it, it's still like a really nice like college even though it's not like one of the uh, most traditional ones it's still like new <laughs> kind of and um and so, yeah, and it was close to the station. And as I knew I was going to go back to Paris quite often, I thought it was quite a, a practical choice. But, um, but yeah, so I applied to Downing after visiting all the different colleges and then ended up being pulled to Girton. And I thought that was complete karma. Like, oh, I tried to be strategic, be close to the station. And I end up the other way of town. But, um, yeah. but actually, it turns out that uh, Downing and Girton share the same director of studies for um, land economy. So usually, whenever they reach their quota for one year, then they'll put the other candidate in school, and Girton will take it, or vice versa. Like same for a friend who applied to Girton, got pulled to Downing to land economy. So um, yeah, it's also something you can be aware of. It's just especially for like smaller courses like land economy, the the most um most colleges might have like quotas kind of or like they only want to take like three four people maximum so so yeah there's a lot of um uh, uh, pulling happening i guess um but yeah yeah that's that's true i agree and so i mean downing is obviously like such a beautiful college to to apply to and um, yeah, I think it's quite funny that obviously Girton is now the furthest, <laughs> the college the furthest away from the station. So you just I yeah. you had to cycle a lot uh, around town. Um, but how did the process go then? Did you receive the letter from Downing and did you have to like re-interview at Girton or no? Um, no, actually it was quite funny. I, uh, I received my admission letter from Girton before I got the rejection from Downing. So, uh, That's what I had as well, yeah. <laughs> um, so yeah, so that was actually good because I didn't have like the kind of disappointment of not getting into Downing. And yeah. I guess in a way, the fact that you don't really care about colleges, like I, yeah, I don't have like any preference for any. So I was just like really happy to go to Gerson. And uh, also I didn't know what Gerson was when I got the admission letter or where it was, but um even after that, like it was, um, yeah, like I loved it. It was, uh, I was definitely really happy to be there. Great. So, I mean, let's there's, then talk about Girton for a bit. So you, yeah, how would you describe it to someone who's just never been to Cambridge before? Mm, so it's, uh, well, first it's <laughs> 2.5 miles away from like a Cambridge city centre and where yes. most colleges are. It's up the hill as well, so you have to be aware that, um, yeah, you'll have to cycle a lot. But that's one thing about Gerritin people, like we have the Gerritin size, we're used to uh, cycling a lot. And um, and yeah, I think it's just a really, it's like one of the largest college in terms of like undergrad intake, like you get 150 people uh, usually in, in a year. So, and everybody lives, yeah, everybody lives on site, so it's like quite big it's um it was um it was one of the I think it was the first UK um like uh female higher education resident like yeah higher education institution like in the UK so you kind of had this like history of like feminism and um getting into uh well it was until the 1970s so it integrated Cambridge and then until the 1970s, it was like female only. And then it was one of the first female colleges to like become mixed. So I think there's a lot of um, great like women history in that college. And that's uh, a lot of people of my for it as well. Like we get a lot of uh, amazing alumni, like the um, Baroness Hell, president of the Supreme Court until this year, or uh, Jane Fraser, the first um CEO, women CEO in the Wall Street Bank. So, um, so yeah, I think there and there's it's really about like a community. I think that I felt more than in other colleges. Like we do a lot of like events. Uh, also, we were celebrating the 150th anniversary of Girton. So there's always a lot of like events going on, alumni coming back, 
Um, and everybody is, uh, is like a little town in itself. Like now it has its own little coffee, uh, cafe. Uh, it has a big Sainsbury's next to it. So it's like, you don't have to go to town. Like, uh, it's, uh, and more and more, I feel like town people are <laughs> coming to us, uh, cause it's just very nice. And we have a pool as well. So if you like sports, I think like, uh, Gerken is great. Like you have really good, like sports facilities. And um, and yeah, it's really green. I like it. <laughs> I miss it sometimes. You could really tell that it was like a close knit college. Um, the grounds are still like really beautiful because obviously it's still you know this kind of like architecture that is very pretty to to look at. Mm -hmm. And then I guess you have like houses next to the college that students can live in. So yeah, it really feels like a little village, like Girton Village. Um, mm -hmm. And I think you have like new accommodation now for um, freshers. So yeah, re a little town within Cambridge. <laughs> actually, not within Cambridge because you actually yeah, see the sign right. "Welcome to Cambridge" when you sign <laughs> into town. Um, yeah. I guess because you had never gone to Girton before, you actually received your offer. How did the first few weeks in Cambridge go? Um, I think it was okay. Like I wasn't. Um... Yeah, I think the the funniest part was just like from the station with my dad when I was moving in, like just tracking, train, uh, taking this super long cab ride to Gerson. It was just like, whoa, how far is it? But um, it takes, I guess also it took a few times to just adjust. We had all this, um, uh, what did I have? Yeah, just having to like get a French uh, UK number, like getting a bag, all these like little things that like administrative stuff that yeah you just have to do. Um, but once, but I think that's another great thing about like Gerton is just like the freshers uh, committee was just great about that. Like they really made sure. Well, we had the international freshers week before, like in, yeah, international people can arrive like a few days later, and then they get to like socialize, us, do a lot of activities, get everything sorted. By the time everybody gets in, like you get the real freshers week, like you're actually settled in and you can actually enjoy and meet people. And um, yeah, that was a great thing about it. And I think you get used to it quite fast just because everybody is living the same experience. And that's great. Like you, everybody supports each other. Would you say then that your college was really influential in your Cambridge experience? I don't think so. I think it's, yeah, it's one of the few subjects where you, you, it's mostly the department. So you, the college, one, once again, the college doesn't really matter. Land economy is such a, a different subject um, to everything else. Like obviously it's like, the, Cambridge is the only university that has land economy. Um, yeah. But, and so because it's so like, well, new, relatively new and uh, different. The fact that it's faculty led is really good. I feel like same mm. in the first few months of university, the like most of my friends were from the course, which was great because I went to all like female college and I was like, oh my God, like I'm never gonna see like guys, like what is this? <laughs> but then actually most of my friends straight away were guys because they were, we were so close with the land economy um, team. And so how did how did it go then for land economy in the first few months? How does like first year go? Um, and yeah, you talked about a bit about supervisions, like can you just tell us a little bit more? Yeah, so first year is uh, for compulsory papers. So it's macroeconomics, micro um, like law, like introduction to like administrative law, constitutional law, which was like really interesting when you don't know like the UK system at all. And um, and then just like introduction to like math and stats and uh, research. And um, yeah, I think it's just like, well, first year is actually great in land economy because you only have the uh, lectures three days a week. You have like less than yeah, 10 hours, uh, 10 contact hours a week. So it's, um, it, yeah, we have a reputation of like being the, the party, <laughs> the first year who parties the most because you just have so much spare time on your hands. Do you think that's true? What are your thoughts on that? I mean, um, I say there's a lot of truth in it. 
but it's half half I'd say like some people yeah some people will be out some people will party but that doesn't mean that they're not working um I guess the fact that we have fewer contact hours means that we can do most of our work during the day and then it makes sense to party after um but but yeah and also I think like uh, another stereotype concerning land is like they're all like sportsmen and it's kind of like the easy degree to get in like apparently they like uh, sports people and because you have few contact hours you can train a lot but once again like there's a lot of people who do sports lots of blues and stuff in Landeg but that doesn't mean they don't work hard and also they have that pressure of having to like balance uh, both sports and training and uh, the land egg because you don't get like a nice treatment just because you're blue or anything so so yeah I think it's it, it's just funny and like if you do land egg and if people like it's just like being a curtain <laughs> it's like you just have to go along with the gag and just like people are jealous if they say that they wish they could party <laughs> as much as you could I agree so much and I think that um like from knowing that a lot of people actually move into land economy in second and third year because maybe it just didn't really work out in the previous course that they did they actually every single one of them realize that like oh actually it's not easy i have to work just as hard and because land economy is not one course it's four different yeah. courses in one you have to have so many different skills that would make you good at law and good at econ and you know good at everything so yeah it's definitely a very holistic degree and talking about partying I always thought that you were a very cool and edgy brand um, <laughs> and I don't know how did you picture the nightlife in Cambridge did you think it was as bad as everyone makes it out to be? <laughs> I think um, if you're used to it depends where you come from I'd say if you're used to the uh, nightlife in in Paris and London it's um it's definitely a downgrade but it doesn't mean you can't have fun like that's one thing I learned as well is like you can have cheesy music all night if you're with your friends and you're just like yeah enjoying like being careless and everything and it, it's still super fun and compared to like a bigger city like at least you know where you're gonna go out so it's First, you don't need to plan your nightlife, and that's definitely a, a time saver. Like, you just know tonight, well, it's not going to be Cindy's anymore, unfortunately, but uh, today is uh, <laughs> We'd like uh, to mourn, take this time to mourn Balare, also known as Cindy's. Um, that's yeah. just announced that it was going to close forever, so that's a very sad time for very sad the temporary cheesy season. music out lovers out there. <laughs> Um, so yeah, so it's good to have like, you know where you're going to meet people from all the different colleges on one evening. So that's a time saver. But also, they always try to accommodate for like different tastes. So as you said, like cheesy music, a bit more techno, like I think there was a lot of like students when I was there. Uh, I don't know how it is anymore. But like, yeah, students trying to be a DJ, students trying to create their own nights in their colleges and everything throwing parties and that's also like yeah great like a kind of like change of scenery especially in summer when you can do it in the gardens and stuff of the colleges and and yeah and if you really need like extra techno or drum and bass I have to mention Junction because <laughs> uh because yeah. that's when you're actually you feel like you're in Cambridge like it's not just Cambridge students you also have like the people from Cambridge like partying there and um, and yeah, it's quite fun like to to experience it as well. Yeah, I love Junction. Some of my best nights were mm -hmm. there, and obviously they get to they're like a bigger club. They're a little yeah. further away, um, closer to the train station. But they invite like when I was there, uh, we had like Skepta coming, we had like Wilkinson yeah. coming. So yeah, some some different nights for different tastes. And I agree with you. It's so I think I would have hated like going to uni in a big city because you just lose your friends in the cab on the way to the club right or people <laughs> might want to go to a different club whereas Cambridge you don't have that choice to make so yeah everyone goes to the same club <laughs> yeah no it's definitely a time saver for us it was a, a money saver because like everybody would 
just take a cab from Gurdjian to and, and back to Gurdjian like on the night out. And, um, and yeah, and it's just like easy and stress-free. And I, I guess, yeah, it's one of those things where the, the city is trying to help the students, you know, so that's a, a good way. And that's why you should uh, engage in it and embrace it and uh, party. <laughs> It's actually great in land economy because you only have uh, lectures three days a week. It's going to be like two hours lectures for like each paper and then like a few supervisions in a week. Supervisions usually, yeah, a group of three, four or five people depending. And you just get to, you get assigned um, an essay, you prepare it, do all the reading, but then you discuss it and um, discuss it in class with your peers. And, um, and yeah, it's really I guess that's one thing is just that supervision depends, like they vary so much depending on who you're in with. So I think by the end of like first year or second year, because we got to like choose which time, uh, like when we wanted the supervision to, ha to happen and you could see who was going where. In a way you can be strategic about like, you could like be with your friends and to be fair, everybody's serious, but, or you could be with like the, people who work like really hard and you know like the, they're gonna say a lot during the supervision and you can just like uh, learn a lot from them as well um because i guess that's one thing is as i was saying during the like, like the interviews at the end of the thing like supervisions are mostly led by the students so the supervisor will be here to like answer your questions explain any concept that isn't or that you need more explanations on but if yeah like i think you can learn way more like from your peers like especially in terms of examples or like or or, or just like in law for example like there's so many like so much of law is about like case studies what ha what happens in that case what happens in that case and sometimes you're just like oh this seems super clear and everything but then someone comes with like this case study like oh what happens is this and you're like oh my god i never i never thought about that and then comes like a really interesting stimulating uh, conversation. So, so yeah, I say, I mean, I don't want to give bad tips, but I know a lot of people who didn't go to lectures, but supervision, you have to go. And I think that like, I understand why you wouldn't go to lectures because I wouldn't say all, to be on, in all honesty, not all lectures are the best. Like you can, they'll give you their slides and they read, they read from their slides. So you don't really need to be there. So I like, I understand if you feel like you're more, you're more comfortable just like learning by yourself, but yeah, supervisions, like you don't want and you can't miss them because those are the real piece of like learning. Yeah, I definitely agree. Like, as you said, some lecturers just like teaching more than others. Like some yeah. people just are born researchers, but they're not teachers, right? So mm -hmm. they're going to learn probably less or it's going to be a bit slower on their side. But yeah, supervision, you have to be prepared. Like you have to, you can't just rock up like a lecture and learn. You have to know everything you want to say in the supervision before you get there and then get ready to like, yeah, as you said, learn new bits of information, learn new case studies mm -hmm. that you can then obviously uh, use for your revisions. So obviously in land economy there, you can go into so many different, I guess, like careers at the end mm -hmm. of it. Um, lots of people become bankers, lots of people become lawyers, uh, mm -hmm. but then you can really do anything. What did you do? What path did you take? Um, so I was really <laughs> confused uh, during my time at Lande because I wasn't really sure. Yeah, I, I just enjoyed many things and I wasn't really sure what I wanted to do. So, yeah, I was like, I, I think I was really, well, I, I still am. Like, I really like real estate. I find it really interesting. But you don't get, even though, like, you get a bit of introduction to, like, finance and real estate, you don't really get practical knowledge for like like how to model and everything and that's like one key component on how they would assess you um so i think for for example real estate there's a lot of like kind of um side uh practice that you need to do for example if you want to follow that path um and then but yeah i just knew that i was i really loved like my papers on like urban economics and like urban planning and 
city development, and that's why I was, uh, well, I settled upon that job in CAM career uh, for the business of cities where I'm working now, and I thought it was just, it would give me, like, the biggest exposure to all the different well, everything that goes into like city development from like the helping like city city governments like define their long term strategy to like understanding like big trends and like urbanization, uh, like what is the future of cities going to be like, but also get to talk to like anyone from people, um, people that working at, with people at JLL, like other like big banks and see how all those businesses are interested in the development of cities as well. So, so yeah, so that's how I ended up where I am. But as you said, there's like so many different paths and um, yes, yeah, like a lot of people end up in, in real estate, commercial real estate or in uh, investment banking, or you can do a conversion, which is one of the great thing, as I said, like the land economy is quite a professional course, like it's accredited, like, um our RCIS accredited, like if you want to become a chartered surveyor, RICS. Uh, if um I'm not sure for town planners, but anyway, and I mean you can go into planning as well if you want. So it's uh yeah, the the yeah, <laughs> so many different yeah. options at the end. Definitely the possibilities are endless. And that's why I think it's quite <laughs> funny that we actually, even though the possibilities are endless, we went into really this a uh, very similar path of like um enjoying urban development and um real estate around mm. cities um so yeah so that's where we met we met at work um the business yeah. of cities and so you said that like me you found this job on the career service of, of cambridge can you tell us about that what's the what's the career service um yeah so the Cambridge, like all big unis, has um, a career service. I think they'll give you the best advice if you know what you want. Like if you say you want to get a training contract, you want to be a lawyer, or um, you want to be an investment banker. Like for all big like industries, they prepare you quite well. They uh, organize like fairs where you get to uh, talk and like they invite a lot of like employers and you get to talk to them. Um, and 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 so I think in a way like. It's still good, I guess, like for people, like I enjoyed it because I could see the different options, like from consulting to, um, and, and they, from consulting to like investment banking to uh, even, I think they, they organized a session on like, yeah, like um, non, uh, like NGO work or um, working abroad and so they, they do uh, have interesting, insightful like events when you get to the point where it's like okay I won't like I'm not really sure what I want to do like they can't really tell they, they can the at the end of the day it's your decision right so that's why at the end I was I, like I wasn't bit disappointed like okay they didn't teach me they didn't help me that much but at the same time I got the I, I knew what I wanted and I just needed to find it inside me um yeah yeah I think that that's that's true I remember um, like just having struggling to get a hold of them because you know as you said um like third years are the priority for them to definitely get jobs yeah. at the end of Cambridge um and people start booking appointments like in August really early. When, you know it starts in October um but yeah I remember having a sort of one-on-one -on -one session with one of their advisors where I could just practice interviewing and then she filmed me and then we watched me um you know as I interviewed and how I responded, mm -hmm. body language and such. Uh, but yeah, definitely, I think if, if you're not quite sure you want to get into one of the main industries that Cambridge like ushers you on to, like law or finance or consulting, mm -hmm. it might just be better or easier for you to kind of find w what you think you could do first with their website, because their website is mm -hmm. so yeah. huge. There's so much resources on it. Yes. We're trying to get a face-to-face -face appointment because that yeah, would definitely. be a bit hard. You reach a good point. Like I forgot to say, it's good. Like uh, they, yeah, they do the CV sessions where they help you like make your CV better and the interview sessions. Like, uh, like they do offer like a a few, uh, yeah, a few good training sessions. I guess 
uh, I just wish like going like looking at people in other unis, they yeah you had more things to prepare you like for example all the I mean they kind they're kind of trying to like for example law or or real estate or um, finance it's like the interview process is like so long and like you have different tests and everything so they kind I think they give you kind of a uh, cognitive test like to train on if you need but um. And they help you prepare for case studies as well. They are like pair you up with a buddy for to prepare case studies for consulting. But yeah, at the end of the day, like you can, there's a lot of things that you can do yourself. I also want to talk about obviously your experience in Cambridge and the fact that you led so many societies. I didn't <laughs> actually know that you were a big lacrosse player, for example. <laughs> I guess I don't know whether you want to start with the French society first or the sports in college um, but yeah tell us more about that experience how that shaped you and how you shaped the team. <laughs> I'm definitely not sure I did uh, I contributed much for lacrosse. Uh, I, I think my experience in Cambridge was just a go with the flow type just Try as much as you can. Like you, you're only here for three years, and try to enjoy as much as possible. So, so yeah, in the end, like I, like I used to never do sports. Like I wasn't a big like athlete, but you kind of like get tagged along. Like when you're in 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 Girton, like they're always training like outside on the sports ground and and super uh, welcoming. You know, like uh, so I kind of joined the, the the volleyball society, especially in Easter term, like when it was like super sunny and you just needed a break from exams, revisions, uh, you could just like go and like do a bit of volleyball. So that was fun. I think I played a few games for the Gerson football <laughs> society, but the lacrosse one was like really fun because lacrosse is such a British American sport. I've been mostly played in the US and a bit here. And I had no idea what it was. It just looked like quite fun. And uh, we had a really nice kit, Cloud Lopez kit. And I was like, okay, let's uh, let let's try it. And it's um and yeah, it was sometimes hard, you know, especially when you are at Jordan and you have to cycle for a game at like on a Saturday at like 10 a.m. with like uh, your lacrosse sticks and everything. It's um you need a lot of like motivation some days, but it's also like super fun. And it's, uh, yeah, it's good to maintain your like, well, a healthy work-life balance, I guess, and just stay active because, well, it's not that staying active is a problem when you're at Jordan, but it's kind of, you want, yeah, it's, it's, it's good to like just run around and like scream and like have fun. And uh, you also get to, it's another way to like meet more people. And that's what I wanted to do like uh, during my three years at Cambridge, just meet as many people and experience as much. Um, so yeah, so that was for the sports and, uh, but yeah, I wasn't, uh, I mean, yeah, I haven't been, I wasn't a blue in anything. I wasn't even trying to be like, you have a lot of success stories of people who weren't athletes and there's just so much into sports, uh, which is super impressive. Like I admire that, but I was more like, let's keep it chill and enjoyable. Same as you, I got like called to just sub in for random people in random <laughs> sports that I had like never played in in college and in college it's always quite a, a nice chilled atmosphere when you play sports it's really different to like the university level sport where for this you probably have to have played most of your life to like get in yeah. the team mm -hmm. um so yeah it's really nice to explore new sports for French society that's another part I think at some point you realize it, like in, at some point like mid first year or like second year that yeah you're a bit homesick you want to like speak French more and like you're obviously you're surrounded by mostly British people and the experience is different for them than it is for you and you kind of want to like find people that you can yeah share your experience see and and feel a bit more at home so I was quite lucky because Gerson in a way has always had a lot of French people. So when I arrived, yeah, I had a friend who was French as well, who arrived at the same time as me. And then we had, uh, I think four French people in second year who welcomed us really well with a lot of wine and cheese nights. And that's how after that with my friend, we were like, we need to do that for the next round of like uh, French people coming to us and, in, and 
yeah, next year. And uh, it actually became a thing. Like we had a lot of, well, we had such a big French intake <laughs> that year. Like I think five, five, six uh, French people. So our night became bigger and bigger. And then we got to invite people from like uh, other colleges. And it was, yeah, just really nice to like, twice or three times in the term just have like one good night where we can just like uh sing french songs like until like 1 a.m drink a lot of nice wine and just like um and and also it's good i guess yeah to get the support like um because we're all doing so many different like topics subjects but we're kind of all in there together so so yeah that was um i think it was important uh for us to do that and yeah, the Cambridge French Society, it's kind of, sometimes a lot of things happen, sometimes it's quite a, like not much happen, but we did a, a few French film nights. And also it's, um you have a lot of like MML people who are, or people who just like, like friends and want to like uh, learn more about the French culture. And it's always nice, you know, to like, when you open it up to like the whole of Cambridge, you get like people from, all different like paths of life like coming and like telling you why they are interested in French culture, what they know, how long they've like been there, like try how many times they've traveled there. And it's like quite nice. It's kind of like boosts your ego, you know, like yes, French culture is still strong. <laughs> and I think we're lucky in France to have um a good view from the international community. Mm. Like people like France, people like wine, people like cheese. So you know it's <laughs> It's yeah. nice. I didn't really take part in French societies, but I kind of regret it because, as you said, like it's just there to provide a new network for you. It's just new yeah. friends. I always thought it would be like, oh, but I won't have anything to say. It'll be awkward. But actually, yeah, no, it's just another way to meet people. Yeah, it's um, it's definitely not exclusive. Like it's a uh like yeah you just like know that you have those French people you can like talk to uh speak in French and like um yeah sometimes it's just like exhausting to be speaking in English like uh, all the time and you just want to break from it but yeah it's like I, I to be fair when I started at Cambridge I was like you I was like I don't want to be that person that French person who just like is with French people all the time and I think I actually did a good job at that. Like all of my, most of my friends from Landek, uh, a lot of people from Garden, like there, there were like international or like from the UK. And I really enjoyed that. Like I, I knew if I wanted to be with French people, I kind of had that group, but at the same time I could like explore and, and network with like, well, just make friends with like uh, many different people from like different places. and. Uh, that's one thing also about Landex, like it was really international. And I, I, I love the, I, I love that because as I said, it's like a matter of like being able to like share experiences with people. And uh, my Landex group of friends was like fully international and then one English person. <laughs> In my year, which might be totally different now, but it was about like 50-50, 50% British, 50% international students. Uh, and they really valued um, in the course and in supervisions and in exams, they really valued international examples. Um, and I always thought that that gives you an edge, um, even though most of like the law you learn is mm -hmm. constitutional. So it's about the UK um, or maybe the EU when you do an EU law. Environmental, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. So it, it was quite nice. I feel like it fits international people quite well. Mm. And I want to ask, given that you had a few responsibilities for like, you know, being team captain and being in the committee for French societies, how did you, how did you go about, about balancing the, the pressure from like the academics with your responsibilities and with, mm. you know, taking care of yourself and sleeping? <laughs> I think, um, yeah, the, like, to be honest, my responsibilities in all of these uh, teams weren't, like, that intense. Like, it's never been the the Cloud Leopards. The Lacrosse team was, like, 10, 12 people uh, at the most. So, it's, you know, like, you're just being regular. We're going to have training on that day, games on that day. And then it's just, like, coordinating with other people. But it, it doesn't take so much time to do it. And same for the French societies. It was mostly 
well, to be fair, we had a president for the Cambridge uh, French Society who was quite on point and he really enjoyed like organizing most of the events actually. So, um, so it was just once again, just like helping, like supporting him in that, but it didn't, it never took like that uh, much of my time. But I think definitely like it, you, you want to organize yourself just in, in terms of protecting your personal life, protecting your, uh, like your socializing time and, and sleeping time as well. Like I, I'd say, yeah, it's kind of trying to, like you wake up early, most of the time you'll have your lecture in the morning and then either you go back to college, like to study, or you stay in time, uh, in town like a bit more. Um, I would I, I would actually enjoy doing that, like just spend the day um, in town and just like revise, like start working in library. Also because we had the Landek uh, library in town, so it was just all the books were there. So um, so I would just stay there with like friends and stuff, have lunch with friends, and then like go back to Gerson like at five or like six for for dinner time. Um, but yeah, and I think also a good thing is they try to like give you as much information from the beginning so that you can you can organize yourself. So like for, well, not all lectures, but some of them would tell you when each essay would be due. And from then you can like work backwards and like say, okay, these days I have to like practice. Well, I have to like start my reading this day. I can like write and everything and be ready for the supervision. So that was really helpful. Like, to be honest, I was like in high school and before that, I just never learned to work. It was always kind of uh, doing last minute essays and everything. So Cambridge kind of like taught me that, like being more organized and like structured or like how I start, like start working and uh, preparing for supervisions. Cause it's, it, yeah, it's uh, in fact, yeah, I just was so clueless about what am I supposed to do with all those readings, all those extra readings? Um, but you kind of, yeah, in second year and third year, you kind of like start making your habits and uh, yeah, becoming more organized, knowing what's important, knowing what you need to do um, and what's just like extra gold dust and, um, and everything. Yeah, and so you had a like, great success academically at Cambridge. Uh, you know, you got a uh, first and um, when you get a first in Cambridge, you become a scholar of your college and uh, you did become a scholar of Girton. So congratulations. <laughs> um, what would you say, given you've just said that like you were, you know, you didn't learn how to learn in like, <laughs> high school. How did you do, how did you bridge that gap? And do you have tips for um, people about like revision tips for anyone who's at Cambridge right now? Mm, so I think it, it's been a, it was a arduous path. Like I didn't like, first year I was super clueless. Second year I was even more clueless because I thought I worked hard, but didn't get the grades I thought I would get so I, I was even more clueless but then in third year I was like okay actually let's see what people are doing and try to like uh, understand and like yeah and make sure it can it can happen Cambridge exams and especially land egg is you have 40 you have three hours for essay 45 minutes per essay and it's just super they're super hard like just to write that much in like 45 minutes and just trying to think and I and, and yeah and I think for the first two years I wasn't ready for that at all because uh, I was trying to say too much but I was never going enough like in, deep enough in my answers so so yeah I would say so that's what I really got in third yeah because in third year I was okay, let's be proactive and understand what's going on. Then, yeah, you have to be strategic about it. And, uh, like, you don't have to, like, revise everything. Like, you'll know some questions. If you look at the past papers, you know that some questions are coming back, like, uh, frequently. Your supervision work is actually preparation towards the exam. So you'll often get, like, questions from supervisions that are, like, popping up as well. And um, and so, yeah, so from that, you can kind of like choose what you want to uh, focus on. So instead of, I don't know, uh, revising the 12 chapters that you studied in Landex, uh, like in one paper, 
um, you'll decide to only revise eight or ten, and four will be like super uh, in depth and everything, and the other one is just like just in case like the questions you want don't fall, like you need to have like a backup plan. So yeah, that's uh, that's the reality of it. You have to be a bit strategic. I still try to like yeah focus on the topics I enjoyed the most. Um, and what else? Uh, yeah, just like throughout like throughout the time like um, throughout the year, you just want to like keep like yeah make your readings for the supervision do them well, make your notes well so that when it's exam term, you don't have to redo them again. Like you can just like use those notes uh, to plan. Uh, your essays yeah I think like one big so as I was saying is like because you have you don't have that much time to think for you know, for when you're taking the exam you want to have a lot of like plans prepared so it's good. so that's what I did like I didn't do um I wasn't that disciplined like doing timed essays like under exam conditions like for every paper and everything but I tried to at least like have ideas of plans in my mind for like, oh, if that question comes, like that's the plan I would take and everything. Um, Cause yeah, it actually saves you like a few <laughs> minutes during the exam, but it makes a difference, I'd say. Yeah, that, I think that's like the best tip. If you, you know, if you can't uh, push yourself to do the timed essays under exam conditions during the year, which I still think is a great tip, but it obviously is. <laughs> if you look at the reality of it, like, people don't do enough anyway having plans for questions that often come up is just amazing and can save you and I really think for me I struggle so much in the first year exams because it's such a shock given the difference with the French system and as you said in my first year exams because I just wasn't prepared enough and I hadn't really seen what examiners at Cambridge wanted to see whether compared to what French examiners wanted to see in high school um, mm -hmm. I really started making my plan during the exam, which obviously yeah. doesn't leave you enough time, right? Yeah. So, yeah, I would say definitely um, get those in advance. And then if you do run out of time it, in your, like, actual exam, because it's the f only exam in the year you'll have to get your grade and to prove yourself to the examiners, yeah. I would say just, like, finish in bullet points. Get your points yeah. across, because... And so at some point, the content is better than the, the form it's written in. Mm. Yeah, no, definitely. And one thing as well is um, the revision lectures and supervisions, like, make the most of them because, I mean, the revision lectures, you might be, oh, they're a bit pointless. I'd rather revise. They come, like, it's, it's in Easter term, so it's, like, especially for us, like, oh, do I really have to make that trip to, do, like, the 20-minute trip to, like, the Landec uh, department? But the lecturers and supervisors, they really want to help you. They're not trying to like uh, to try trick you and stuff. So they usually give you a lot of good tips for like what's to come up in the exam. And same for the supervisions, like or at least like you can contact, you can reach out to your supervisors and ask them what do you think this is worth, or like can you correct this plan for me? Um, can you do you have advice on how to do that and I only realized that in third year when I was like okay after two years I'm still not like like even when I put like as much work as possible and I know I have my knowledge it's still like not giving me like the grades I want and then yeah I just like asked my supervisor and like I think two or three they all like corrected like my time essays or plans and a few of them, even one was like super nice just like Let's do a Skype, like go through it, like have your own one-on-one -on -one so that you actually know what, what is expected. And yeah, same as fast paces, they also give you like the, how is it called again? Like, you know, that thing where they comment on the papers that were taken that year. Examiner's report. Yeah, exactly. And those are also like good things. Like I think a lot, well, not for all papers, unfortunately, but a few lecturers and supervised, well, examiners are, good at like telling you what was expected for that question where what did the students who did really well like what did they do and um and yeah so that's also a helpful like guidance for you and do you have looking back at your experience at Cambridge do you have any regrets um I think 
in a way, because I guess I'm, I decided to stay in the UK, <laughs> um, I, maybe I should have done more on the, I don't know, like networking side or career, building your career side. Um, I mean, I love my job. Uh, like I'm super happy, but just in general, like I feel like you, yeah, there's just like so many people you like could talk to, reach out to, just to know, because I, I was always in that hesitation. Should I do a master's? Because if I go back to France, I'll need a master's and everything. But I was never able to uh, make a decision. And I think in a way, it's the fact that I never really reached out to people and see like, okay, if I was to do that job, do I need a master's or what skills would you require? Or like, how, how can I build up a bit more my CV? But at the end of the day, it's not a regret per se, but I say that's something that I would definitely advise other people because like, even if it's um, not something you might end up doing, it's always good to talk to people that are all already working and they can give you a lot more advice about just, yeah, how to apply to things, how to prepare for like interviews, how to get an internship. They might even offer you internships. And I think that really makes a difference, especially when in such a competitive uh, pool of candidates competitive times like you never know what's going to happen so you kind of want to have the strongest profile as you can uh, but yeah definitely and um on the other side of the coin do you remember what your like happiest day at Cambridge was or what was your happiest memory at Cambridge <laughs> ah I have plenty but I'd say definitely like um after exams like going to Grandchester with friends or like not not even May week like all the ball well it's mostly May during May week but like not even the ball but just being in Cambridge with your friends after exams stress-free and uh yeah it's like I guess yeah my happiest memory if I had to pick one was like the garden party at St. Edmund's and it was just like I finally managed to get my friends from Jordan to come to that party. I had the Landex friends coming as well. There was like everybody there just to like party and have a good time. It was also third year so a bit bittersweet because we weren't really sure where everybody would be like uh, the, in the next few months but uh, but yeah definitely the, the best times were stress-free times. <laughs> I agree that whole week between like the stress of exams and then the stress of May week because even though May week is such a a, a full and happy time it can be stressful to like you know yeah. not sleep completely change your your sleep schedule and like cycle within yourself but also going yeah from ball to ball maybe you're working at the ball etc but that that just that tiny gap between the two <laughs> where you can, yeah, cycle to Grantchester Meadows and uh, go punting and just enjoy everything stress-free. It, it, it is amazing. So that's, that's such a good memory. Um, and thank you so much for being on this podcast. I'm so glad that we could chat even during, you know, COVID times. It's great to see you remotely. Thank you very much for having me. I hope that was helpful for people in Cambridge and people applying. And uh, yeah, hope, uh, hopefully I'll see you uh, soon in, uh, in real life. Hi guys, thanks so much for listening to this newest episode of the Oxford and Cambridge Project. If you've enjoyed this episode, please do like, share and subscribe to this channel as it really helps other people find the podcast.